Well, greetings, everyone. I'm David Arendelle, and I'm going to be sharing with you an overview of video-based supplemental instruction. It's one of the six programs which I monitor about peer-assisted learning programs in tertiary or post-secondary programs. As you can see our circle here, it'd be the one that's over here at this location, provide you an overview and also some of the challenges with implementing such a complex course redesign model. Well, VESI uh, defined is it really is a course delivery system. It's a way in order to control the flow of the information so that you end up doing the academic review, the learning strategy development, at the same time as you are uh, looking at understanding the course content material, which is quite rigorous. This place is VSI is a different kind of peer learning program in comparison with the others in this series, because we're looking at something that is a drastic course read design, because it was intended originally as a way to educate young people who were located in the outer villages in South Africa. That was really where the original place started at. The universities wanted to bring more students into the institutions that normally had not had an opportunity to attend school. Here in the United States, it was designed in order to replace developmental level courses which could not be offered at the university uh, in Kansas City, University of Missouri, Kansas City. So this was developed in the 1990s. It was co-developed by Drs. Martin and Blanc. It was a remarkable program. It also was highly complex in order to be able to institute it. Now, what's the differences between SI and VSI, if you're familiar with the SI model? As I've already said, on one side, SI was about an enrichment program in order to help students to incrementally improve their grades. On the other hand, VSI, quite different. It was a complete redesign of the way that the course was offered to students. Voluntary versus mandatory attendance. You earn college content credit. Plus, also, you could also, for many cases, receive study skills credit as well. The VSI facilitator guides while the SI leader guides SI sessions. The activities are inserted inside of the lectures, which are recorded on video, and it can be focused on particular student populations. Here in the United States, it was oftentimes used with as a replacement for developmental level courses. It takes an awful lot of infrastructure in order to be able to institute a VSI model. What well, was the goals of it? Well, as I said, replacing developmental level courses, and this was back in the 1990s. So doctors Martin and Blanc really pre, um, were precursors of today's movement about course redesign in order to eliminate the need or to change dramatically the way that developmental level courses are offered. Well, like all the other programs, higher academic achievement, they wanted to reduce the time that it took in order to prepare students for college-level courses. They didn't want them to have to take semester after semester of developmental-level courses. They wanted to be able to solve that in one fail swoop at the beginning of their first academic term. Students le uh, learn to master their learning strategies while enrolled inside of the course. Now, that would also be true for some of the other models that are out there, ESP, PL, uh, TL, SLA. So it's not unique about this idea about doing it while you are enrolled in the rigorous uh, introductory course. There's a lot of time uh, that students have to allocate eight hours on average per week for each three credit hour course if you're using a semester course system. But what you're doing is that you're managing their study time. So we're taking the time that they normally would spend alone 
studying for the course, now we've incorporated it into working as a cohort together. What's the major assumption here? Well, it's got to integrate and master during the class lecture. See, one of the challenges is that with SI, you go to class, and then days or hours later, then you end up having an SI session. Well, in the in-between time here, things get forgotten. With the VSI model, you do it right in the middle of the lecture. There is no other place for you to go to. It's all part of the course. And that's the reason why the students who had lower predictions for academic success at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, were able to take these VSI courses, develop the learning strategies they needed in order to be able to navigate and do well in all their other college courses, well, they're able to do that during their first academic term. Well, there's an awful lot of requirements in order to be able to implement a VSI program. This is part of the reason why you don't find VSI often done inside the United States. It's more often offered over in Eastern Europe and in South Africa, but there's still a few isolated places inside the U.S. that's still doing VSI. So why was it so difficult? Well, you end up having to really make a strong commitment to make this part of the campus retention program. You need to be able to have substantial amounts of funding for the initial startup of recording all the class lectures on video, ongoing support of the VSI staff members, stipends to the instructor. So there's a lot of money that is involved, but once again, it comes back to, is that cost or is that an investment? It all depends on how you see that. If you see that this is the kind of investment you need to make in order to see success occur, well, then this is simply an investment or an opportunity cost then. Mid-level leadership, this is kind of looking at the academic deans or the department chairs, where they're going to be responsible for the annual salary. While the orders may come authorizing this from the upper levels of the institution, it's going to be the mid-level people, the college deans and the academic department chairs are going to have to be the ones to make sure to authorize the creation of the course in order to authorize the space and then for the department, well, they'll need to make some curricular changes. They need to make a video section of the content course. It looks exactly the same way as what the professor teaches whenever he or she does face-to-face -face instruction. Well, there's going to be a separate video section of the course. And along with that, there's going to be a paired course in order to recognize all the skills and mastery that's going on. And also recognition that it's eight hours a week that the students are in class over multiple days. So maybe two hours a day, Monday through Thursday. Well, that's going to take an awful lot of development of curricula and approval by the appropriate academic review groups in order to create another course then. And also the academic advisors, they've got to be part of this system as well because they're going to be the ones who are going to be recommending students to take this particular section. For the most part, these class sections here in the United States are not open for the general student population. They generally are for students who are predicted as needing a developmental level course before that they would be permitted to take the video section of the course, which tends to be as it was at UMKC, was either a general chemistry course or a algebra course or a American history course. Well, there's an awful lot of requirements, obviously, for a faculty member. You're going to have to find a faculty member who wants to actually be committed to this kind of a model and place their course lectures all onto video and also probably receive a course release or overload pay in recognition of all of this. 
And then during the academic term, so this is all before you end up doing it. This is the development time. Well, during whenever you're offering these video sections of the courses, they need to come and meet with the students so you can make an identification between this person on the video and the actual professor. They also need to be involved with providing the student grades because the grading is actually done by the professor or his or her uh, teaching assistant. And then also meet with the VSI facilitator, but that could occur during that professor's office hours. So there's an awful lot of commitment of time here from a faculty member who, from our point of view, we had kind of a saying, a professor who would do anything except drop their academic standards. We want somebody with high standards, but also with someone who has high energy about helping students in an alternative way to become better students and those who are going to be more likely to graduate. Now, you're going to need to have some sort of a supervisor to manage this whole enterprise of the course development as well as whenever the course is being offered. So they provide the overall leadership. They're going to develop all the curricula that goes along with videotapes. The professor doesn't develop all of the workbooks and the worksheets and all the other curriculum materials that go with this video section of the course, which is going to have extensive opportunities to practice learning strategies. That really needs to be somebody else because that's probably not going to be in the skill set for the professor. Their skill set's going to be in chemistry or American history or algebra. It's not going to be in, well, how do I go and have students take my material in a particular unit and be able to employ different learning strategies in order to not only master the rigorous content, but also to be able to practice using a myriad, 50 different kinds of learning strategies and activities inside the session. This has to happen by somebody else. We also need to hire, train, evaluate, and supervise the student facilitators who are going to be running these sessions. So the professor's not running these. The supervisor is not. We're going to get to the facilitator here in a moment. You need to have some training and basic methodology for how to be able to run these kinds of sessions. And you can pick that up by going to the International Center for Supplemental Instruction located at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, or perhaps one of the other regional uh, sites in the world that are located in Canada, uh, in Sweden, uh, Australia, and South Africa, particularly the South African office in order to receive additional training. It takes a lot of work to be able to do this. Obviously, that uh, supervisor is going to need to be a liaison. They're going to need to continue their professional development. So they're going to not only train the facilitators, the student leaders, well, they're also going to need uh, final um, opportunities for them to be able to go and receive some professional development too. So the supervisor has a lot of roles and responsibilities. Uh, it takes days of teaching and practice and planning in order to create these things. This supervisor, well, they're going to be responsible for the selection of the course, and also they're going to be responsible for hiring of the facilitator then, and also all the evaluation. And there's a whole host of other activities that they would be responsible for. Now, what's it take in order to be the facilitator of these eight hours worth of sessions per week? They stop and stop, start and stop the videotape about every 10 to 20 minutes. And then they have additional activities they're doing in between practice review of the material, uh, integrating and understanding how to be able to employ the appropriate learning strategy and study skill at the appropriate time. So this person needs to have a high grade. They need to be able to model good student behaviors while they're inside of these VSI sections. They need to be a graduate student because they need to have more content knowledge and more, I think, probably 
uh, maturity than a first-year student would have. So that's the reason why it's going to be a graduate student, which also means that it's going to be probably at the G. TA level for salary, and that's also probably plus benefits. So that's the reason why this program requires a fairly large investment. But if your alternative is, like UMKC faced by edict, the University of Missouri system did not permit developmental level courses. Well, we all know, and I used to work there for approximately 15 years, I had the privilege to work alongside the people who were running these programs and creating lots of conversations with Dr. Martin and Dr. Blanc about the program and the underpinnings and such. It was an exciting time to be in Kansas City. Uh, also, the facilitator also needs to have some office hours. They need to also be preparing uh, their lesson plans. They may end up having a workbook, but they still have to be able to work on the plan for what they're doing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And there's more responsibilities for the facilitators than just this. So let's just kind of take a couple of slides here to just kind of remind us what the complexity of all of this is. We've got to find a professor who is well-respected and is interested, teaches a historically difficult course. The courses that we use for general chemistry, which is uh, challenging for a lot of students. Um, the American history course, the uh, college algebra course professor has to go and put the entire course on video. Um, we're not going to over edit those videos. The goal is to have it like the classroom. That's part of what the goal is. We want students not to see some of these really nicely edited, well sophisticated video lectures. Those are good things. Those are wonderful things. But we want students to experience the rigor of the course just like anybody else would if they were sitting in the lecture hall. Back at that time, the general chemistry course had about 250 students in it. We don't need to debate the uh, merits of whether or not it's right or wrong about the way that they do it. The issue is that's the way it was. So what we want is we want those regular lectures and they're going to be done inside of a TV studio. We've tried, I think, at one point to try to catch these lectures as the professor actually was delivering them in the 250-person uh, lecture hall. And it was just a mess because the sound was not right. The professor, um, the graphics that were being placed up on the whiteboards behind the professor were hard to see. There was ambient noise from the students inside the classroom. There was class management things that professors do before and after the lecture along with inside. And all of those things were all just distractors. What we needed was we needed for the professor to be inside of a TV studio, sit down, have an overhead camera that could catch that professor writing on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper the things that would normally go up on the whiteboard behind them. So that's the reason why that was as accurate of what was happening in the classroom without all the other distractions. So, as I said, we need to give academic credit for the content and the study strategies. So, generally, you'd be in class for eight hours, and generally, you would end up receiving six credits, three for the content and three for the study skills. Um, so, as I said, and then the development of student workbook. Not done by the professor, but that's being done by the supervisor of the program. Steps to deliver a VSI course. Well, we need, as I said earlier, you need to have a video section of the course, and you need to control who it is that gets in by the academic advisors. Because, once again, we're really designing this class for students who are predicted to have academic challenges with the course material. 
scheduled class time. We've already been talking about the eight hours. Professor administers. It's the exact same exam. Exact same exam for the 250 in-person students as well as those here. Hire the facilitator to help process the video because it'd be really easy for the students to just simply let the video play for 50 minutes and then to do their review and all the other things at the end. What we discovered was you've got to frequently stop the video and immediately make applications and immediately answer questions and to practice those learning strategies, all of those things. So it's a highly interactive uh, classroom period. I would go down to the classroom and watch one of my colleagues who was serving as the facilitator during the very first term. And it was really quite a remarkable place. One of the things that was really important was all the students had their own whiteboard. In fact, uh, Dr. Kay Patterson, uh, who was our first person to serve as a facilitator, uh, later on we ended up going to the graduate students, but the very first time out, and she really showed me how important it was to use the whiteboards, we're talking about the little ones that are like about two foot wide by about one foot. That was such a remarkable learning tool that really kind of takes you back to the little blackboards inside of classrooms back during the 1800s. Uh, it was really a remarkable experience. Sorry for kind of taking off on a tangent there, but it was a really a fond memory as I'm sitting here doing this video, remembering the work that Kay was doing with her, her students then. The session operation. Well, a lot of detail. I just want to hit a couple of highlights here. They're working concurrently to develop mastery of the content of the chemistry course along with study strategies. Students are highly interactive. As I said, we're stopping somewhere here. I'll talk. Here it is. It's about um, 10 to 20 minute breaks in the video. And sometimes the video actually would get stopped more frequently than every 10 minutes. In fact, one of the strategies was to stop the video after the first minute. The first minute. Because so, sometimes students are not as attentive at the very beginning. Professors generally give an overview for what's going to happen. There's critical things happen during the first 60 seconds of class, but sometimes students don't notice. Maybe it's because of whatever reasons. I'm not going to try to unpack what those reasons are, but we'll, what we're able to do inside of VSI is to train students to increase their observation of what's happening with whatever the professor says at the beginning or at the end. And I noticed that with my own students whenever I was teaching a global history course. It's kind of tempting to start powering down the last minute, two minutes of class because I worked at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. It's a huge campus. They give you 15 minutes passing time, and you may have to run from one end of the campus to the other. No lie, the Mississippi River runs through the middle of the Minnesota campus. So it is students out the door running or bicycling to get to the other part of the campus, and if they're on the other side of the bridge. The reason why I kind of went off on that little tangent for a moment is, is understanding students are focusing energy we're trying to help students don't miss the cues that the instructor is giving you in the first minute, in the last minute of class. So that's the reason why the, the video is stopped often. Somewhere in here it's talking about, well, who's running the remote control? I think that'll come up on another slide here in a moment. But at the beginning of the academic term, the facilitator is the one that's probably stopping the video more often. Because the students, by default, they just kind of think, well, just leave it alone. I'll take my notes and we'll wait till the lecture's over with. As you get into the middle of the academic term and particularly at the end, the students are running the, um, the remote control. 
Uh, the facilitator on rare occasions will need to go and request that the student is holding on to the remote to stop. But most of the time, it's the students who are controlling the flow of the information. So it's this whole issue about regulating flow is as much as a skill as anything else that the facilitator is doing then. The students gradually increase their control of the pace. And that was one of the basic lessons that we learned in VSI, and that was students can handle really difficult courses if they can somehow control the flow. The problem is they don't know how to be able to control us as faculty members. And why is it they don't stick up their hand and say, you're going too fast, please repeat? Well, it's embarrassing for them to do so. That's what the students tell us in research studies, that it's really difficult to admit in front of a classroom of 250 people, I'm the only one that's not getting this, and I can't keep up with you, and could you repeat? Actually, if everyone was honest in the room, they would probably be a lot more hands going up saying, I need for you to slow down. With this kind of a model here, we can have really difficult material, stop the video, and then the student can think about what just got said, look at their notes, look at their assigned readings, talk amongst themselves in some organized activity. The facilitator is in the soup here. Once again, there's a lot more complexity, and I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of time to look at the uh, slide here very sophisticated thing that's going on. And it was the lesson learned was that you can actually take a lot of really difficult courses and somehow if you could slow down and control the content at the speed that the students want, they could actually handle it even without a facilitator. It's much richer because of having the trained facilitator in there and the workbook and the integration of all of these activities but it's this issue about control of flow. For a lot of students, this is kind of the way that classes look like whenever they show up. They're isolated. They've got their lecture notes. To what degree, no one's ever really trained them how to be able to take lecture notes. And to know that lecture notes ought to look different, probably, in different classes. And then a textbook, or a lot of us, as I did, is went to online uh, readings that were free. And then you had other additional outside readings. And these things all kind of orbit around the class. And while we as instructors, we've carefully selected all of these things, but we've not intentionally, clearly always organized them so it made sense. Inside of VSI... Well, this is a little bit ideal, I suppose, but all of a sudden you get to organize all of these and you get to see the relationships among these. And this allows students to finally start making sense. They start taking all of this and they take it and they connect it with what they already know, past knowledge. Students know a lot more than they sometimes think that they know. They don't always know, well, how do I make a connection between my past knowledge and today? And then how can I make a prediction of what's going to be coming up for the near future? And it's this issue about making connections, that students can handle much more difficult academic material. There's four things that happen inside of these VSI sections. Let me just go ahead and flip over to here. They preview vocabulary. They don't make assumptions that we all understand the terminology that's coming up. So we're going to preview what's going to be coming up. What are the topics that are coming up? As some of you are familiar, there was a famous uh, learning strategy it was called SQ3R, and I'm not going to take the time to uh, explain all of that for you. This video is going on much too long, probably. But if you look up in Google SQ3R, you'll find a study strategy 
and that actually dates back decades ago, that actually deals with this issue that we need to preview what's coming up because it actually helps us to be prepared to learn the material. It kind of warms the brain up. It makes connections what we previously studied, and now we're going to be ready. Then we start processing the video lecture, stopping it when necessary. And as I said, oftentimes this could be every 10 minutes. And then we end up doing a review function where we're looking at the study strategies, what it is that we've learned, and we're doing all of these activities to make sense. And then we end up polishing, which is getting even more clear about what are the expectations, what were the key concepts, and then preparing for the examinations. So preview, process, review, and polish. It's this issue about student control, and that's one of the basic lessons. We can handle much more difficult material if we're able to control the flow. Resolve the misunderstandings immediately. We don't have to wait three days. We already know from the research, actually one of the research studies on the forgetting cycle was done here at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And whatever you hear, assuming you're not taking lecture notes, but inside of a class you hear something, and then you wait two weeks... And then you try to remember what it was that you heard two weeks ago. You've forgotten 98%. And that was not for academically inadequate students, underprepared students, whatever phrase you want to use. That's just the average person. So this is the reason why the student control and the immediacy of what you're able to do inside of it that is so powerful. So once again, there's a lot of advantages to media-delivered content. We do an awful lot of this nowadays. We have independent learning. We have uh, more learning that's online with asynchronous learning. So students control the flow of lectures. So what was really unique back in the 1990s is really maybe not quite as unique today, but there's still an element of VSI that... Uh, is a distinguishing model, and I think it's something that even if it wasn't tried to be replicated on a full model, well, maybe think about perhaps making a series of modules about the six key concepts in biology or chemistry or history. Here's just a little model that... Um, talks about what's hopefully going on inside of these sessions. At the beginning of the term, the facilitator has a lot of the control. The students don't know quite what to do. As you go through over the course of the academic term, the students are taking over more control. Well, applications of VSI today, as I said, it's going on in Eastern Europe, the UK, and South Africa, a few places inside the U.S., a few places are using it to mainstream developmental education, and you see the other ones that are down here. So there's a variety of places where VSI has been done. Now, one of the challenges with VSI uh, is that it's highly effective serving small numbers of students. In those VSI uh, student sections, they were generally limited to less than 20 and the ideal number actually was 15. So this was a smaller program. High, high success, but also it receives high, high marks for investment costs in order to pull it off. And then here are a few articles which have been published over the years. Um, the most comprehensive one would be the one by Maureen Hurley, who was one of my colleagues at UMKC while I was there. She did her dissertation on VSI back in 2000, and you can see the other uh, studies which have been done on VSI. If you'd like to learn more about VSI, well, it's inside of our um, uh, annotated bibliography. There's like 1,550 uh, publications inside. Probably, I would guess there's probably 25 to 30 publications on VSI. 
go to z.umn.edu peer bib would be the website. So not only do you see the big um, uh, bibliography, you can also look at it by programs and you can actually pull out easily just the ones for VSI. And you can also do topics as well. Uh, as I'm recording this, it's March of 2020. The flu pandemic is causing enormous loss of life and sickness and disruption throughout the world. Well, one of the topics is on, you can look at just a bibliography, an annotated one, oftentimes with web links to take you to the online article. And one of the topics is about online academic support. How are people doing SI, for example, online? or peer-led team learning online. And all of that is available for you. And then for more information, well, you have these websites here. I already talked about the peer bib one. I also have a general service one on peer learning. I also have one uh, that identifies all of my articles that I've published on supplemental instruction or on the hybrid version we created here at University of Minnesota called Peer Assisted Learning, and that's this one here on Pubs Peer. And then also we have a YouTube channel where perhaps you found this video that you're watching right now. And there's other ones in the series that looks at the other major peer learning programs, interviews with facilitator, the student leaders of those peer programs, and much, much more. And then here's my contact information on the bottom. One of the challenges with VSI is that it's currently not being implemented at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. So there are no training locations inside the U.S. for you to have a detailed study of how to be able to do VSI. So this is one where you'd have to be on your own to read the literature. I'd be happy to communicate and share with you uh, what I learned and know from my time in working alongside the brilliant team that developed uh, VSI. Um, I think that while it may be enormously difficult to replicate because of all the upfront investments, I think there's lessons to be learned from VSI. And that's the reason why I still wanted to do this video. And I think that there might be some things that could be implemented on a smaller scale. So it's been a, a treat being able to talk to you about something that I was very privileged to see created and implemented. Thanks for listening today. I hope my words are useful in your work in helping students to achieve their dreams. Take care, everyone.